Father, we love the privilege of worshiping you as a church. We love the privilege of singing your praises and lifting high your name. We thank you for these rich lyrics that have given us expression to uh, our desire to, to worship you rightly and to worship you appropriately. Thank you for the, the context where on a Lord's Day we can gather and, and worship you, but we know that by worshiping you corporately, there's something unique even over and against the worship we would render to you throughout our whole lives, and that is the, the corporate mutual edification that we sing psalms, spiritual hymns and songs to one another as we, as we worship you. And, and there's a horizontal benefit to hearing the praises of your people and sharing life with other saints who are waging war on the world and their own heart, fighting and striving with all their might and main to glorify you, knowing that a heart that is full of joy at the prospect of having Christ, of knowing Christ, of knowing your Son, and being restored to good terms with you um, in the face of any trial is such a profound encouragement. And this is what happens here, Lord, in, in the corporate gathering and in, in the life of the church as as an overflow of body life, we're not just singing songs stranger to stranger. We're singing songs brother to brother and sister to sister, knowing that the trials and victories, the, the, the victorious faith that exists in this room as we sing these songs is a ministry to each and every one of us. So we want to thank you for the opportunity for corporate worship this morning. And now, Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, this is ultimately the, the, the climax of worship to be able to submit our heart to the truth. And what a privilege this is to give attention to your word. So now we pray that you would grant us faith, a heart that bends, a heart that inclines, a heart that submits, minds that want to consider the implications of this truth for what it means to follow you, what it means to be faithful Christians. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified and honored not just by the preaching of the word, not just by the sitting under the word, but by the submission to the word. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I want to invite you to grab your Bibles and open up again to the Gospel of Mark. And as you're turning to Mark chapter 1, I just want to make a comment. I, 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 can't help but, I can't help but say how much joy it brings me to study the life of Christ and how much how much uh, benefit there is in studying the life of Christ. And, and I, I trust that as we work through the life of Christ, you're, you're benefiting as, as, um, as we look at what Mark, the message that Mark has for us. And, and I, I, I just love the, the dynamic that we get to gather as a church, we get to proclaim the gospel as we take the Lord's Supper, we, we get to sing His praises corporately, and then we dive into texts. And, you know, if you think about what the, what the world would think about what we do here, dive into some relatively obscure text from the end of Mark chapter 1. And to make no apologies about the meaning of this text having important implications for us today, and that this message is enough for us today. There's, there's a sufficiency in what we are going to learn today. That's actually so enriching for us as a body, is it not? You think about uh, the constant tendency to simplify Christianity and to just make it uh, the same old rep repetition, and then you look at the, the multi-varied diversity of truth that is contained in the Scripture. It, it just, there, there's, there, there's sufficiency for every circumstance we could face. There's sufficiency for every thought we would ever have. There's sufficiency for equipping us to please God no matter where He puts us. And so this multifaceted richness and the diversity of the truths contained in the Word of God is completely sufficient for us. And so I just love 
being able to just dive into what, uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe somebody here listening to this is a visitor, and you're like, well, I don't know why we're in Mark, and we're about to dive into some relatively obscure text, and you're thinking, well, why did that deserve uh, 45 minutes, an hour worth of our time? Uh, well, we make no apologies for that. God knows what he's doing, giving us these texts, and we look at every aspect of Christ's life, and it has implications for us. And so this deepens our worship, it deepens our our relationship with Christ, it matures us, and it equips us for what God has for us. And so I want to just quickly make a a quick comment about, uh, by way of review, we are going to look at Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 39 this morning, and this story um, really is very tightly connected to last week's narrative. Last week's narrative, we looked at Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, and the title of that was um, the, uh, well, I'm trying to remember what the title of that was. <laughs> I'm looking at my new title, the, the, the Authority of Jesus' Teaching. There we go. I looked at my, my current title, and I forgot my old title. So last week, it was the Authority of Jesus' Teaching, and we saw Jesus stepping into a synagogue in a particular story, and in that particular story, he did cast out a demon. But Mark makes it very clear that this was his habit to be living in the Sabbath at the synagogue, and his job was to teach, and his teaching was with authority because it was so unlike the authority of the scribes. Of course, they lacked authority. And his teaching was authoritative, and it was so distinct for that reason. He didn't come in quoting positions and quoting arguments. He spoke truth rooted in his own personal authority and the authority of God's word currently in that story, the Old Testament. And so Jesus' teaching possessed a supernatural authority that was totally foreign to the synagogue teaching that they had experienced up to that point. In this story, the point is very similar, but it expands on it, and that's why the title this morning is The Priority of Jesus' Teaching. Of all the things Jesus could have done in his ministry, and he did a lot of things, of all those activities, of all of those uh, benefits that he rendered to people, the one that was his priority was his preaching and his teaching. That's why Jesus came, to be a human mouthpiece for a divine message. That was his calling. That was his role, Jesus was a preacher. I want to read this story before we dive in. I want you to follow along with me, and you'll see it in the last two verses. What leads up to those last two verses are, are uh, the responses to Jesus' message, and, and these, these, these responses are, are actually quite misinformed. Verse 29, Mark writes, and immediately they came out of the synagogue, and that's referring to the story that was started in verse 23 and ended in verse uh, 27. They leave the synagogue on that particular Sabbath day, and they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Okay, so you remember these are the four disciples that he's already called back in verses 16 to 20. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand. And the fever left her, and she waited on them. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. He said to them, let us go somewhere else, to the towns nearby, so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching 
in casting out demons. Here, Mark tells us three stories in preparation for his section here on the unbelief of the Jewish leaders. If you remember where we're at in the book of Mark, this first section from chapter 1, verse 16, all the way through chapter 8, verse 21, is really, it's really a focus on Jesus' shocking identity. His identity is so shocking, it does not seem to be that anyone quite is up to speed on who Jesus really is, save only Mark, our narrator, telling that to us as readers, and he tells us that in the first verse. The only characters in the story who seem to be aware of Jesus' true identity are the demons. They're the only ones ascribing to him the Holy One of Israel, the Son of God, and, and they recognize his identity. Everyone else seems to be pretty slow on the uptake, even including the, the 12 disciples. And so here, as he's preparing us for the unbelief of the leaders, and then the unbelief of the population, and then even the resident unbelief still in the hearts of the disciples, as he's preparing them for future ministry, he's showing us Jesus' ministry is one that's focused on, it, it prioritizes the preaching of the Word of God. In this story that starts in verse 29, Mark continues the story immediately after that, that shocking story where he casts out demons. And remember, what was so profound about Jesus' uh, exorcism was that the people who were there walked away with a unified commentary on the entire experience, and that is, wow, this man teaches with authority. And he casts out demons, and they submit to him too. <laughs> but the overwhelming takeaway, the unmistakable emphasis of Jesus' ministry, even on those who actually saw the exorcism, was that they were impressed with his teaching. His teaching made bigger impact on the even unbelieving audience than his exorcism. And now, in verse 29, they, they head home. Simon's house, if you've been to Capernaum, the ruins of his house, which is most likely still, actually literally his house, it, it does not seem to be one of those. There, there are some sites in Israel where you're like, yeah, this doesn't, this doesn't fit the biblical data. Um, but that fits the archaeological data, and it fits the biblical data. It's just, it's just a short distance from the, uh, from the synagogue, and Capernaum being a small town. Um, anyway, they, they headed over to uh, Simon and Andrew's house. And this kind of seems to be the headquarters of, um, of Jesus' ministry, at least in the, in the seasons of ministry where he's ministering out of Capernaum. Um, so they go, to, they go to Simon and Andrew's house. Uh, Simon's mother-in-law is there. So you, you have Simon, you have Andrew. They're already adult men. They already run the fishing business that's, that they've inherited from their father. Um, and, and that's what they were abandoning even to follow Jesus is to give up the, the active oversight of that kind of business. So you have two adult males in the house plus their own families and even Simon Peter's mother-in-law. So his wife's mother is living in the house as well. And if you've been there, you've seen the footprint. It's actually a pretty large pretty large home, especially for Capernaum standards, but that would make sense for how, how uh, massive the, the, the family here, the extended family is that lives in this, in this house. And so his mother-in-law is lying sick with a fever. And uh, this is not, you know, they put a thermometer in and she was 98.9. I mean, this is, as Luke says, an extreme fever. It's a, uh, the, the, the adjective is megalopurito. It's a, it's a massive fever, a profound fever, or as it's usually translated, a high fever. Uh, this is a very significant fever to the point that it's put her in bed. She's, she's stuck in bed with it. So it's not just, oh, I'm feeling a little under the weather. She, she's just incapacitated because she's that sick. And so immediately they go and speak to Jesus about her because they're concerned about her welfare. They're concerned about the, the, her, her health and uh, what this might mean because who knows what's even causing this fever, and it's pretty extreme already. Verse 31, he comes, and he, he comes to her and raises her up, taking her by the hand, which would have been against customary practice. It would have been a little bit uh, outside the bounds of normalcy to even touch for a, any, any man to touch a woman outside of his own family. But he grabs her by the hand to raise her up out of the bed, and the fever left her. The fever's instantly gone, but not just in some sort of medical like diagnosis. Oh, okay, you, you know, the, the, somehow it's been the, 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 the virus or the, or the bacteria has been removed, but 
the symptoms and everything. The disease has been absolutely reversed to the point that all the symptoms are immediately gone. It does not require a medical diagnosis because the symptoms have so immediately left that there's no question that the healing was immediate and complete. In fact, every time Jesus heals, it's immediate and complete with the notable exception of Mark chapter 8, and that's for good reason, and we'll get to that very shortly in a few years or months. It's also interesting that every time Jesus commits a miracle, performs a miracle, does a sign or a wonder, every single time, it reverses the curse. You ever thought about that? Diseases being eradicated. Demons who have been given a surrogate, um, delegated authority over this world are being exercised and being cast out of people. The natural disasters which would kill people and harm the economy, is being reversed and stopped. The only exception, there's only one time Jesus does a miracle that's not positive, that's not restorative, that's not a reversing of the curse, and that's when he curses the fig tree with good reason. We'll get to that in Mark chapter 11. With those two exceptions, every single miracle of Jesus Christ reversed the curse, was positive, was entire and complete in a moment. And by the way, Jesus is not a a one-string banjo when it comes to miracle working. It doesn't matter what type of disease. It doesn't matter how complicated. It doesn't matter how long, whether it's chronic or whether it was short-term. It doesn't matter. He's just reversing all of it. To the point that in verse 31, she, having been raised by Jesus out of the bed, immediately starts waiting on them. She starts serving them. And Mark uses the same word that's used of Jesus. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, now Peter's mother-in-law stands up and starts serving them. In a day without any of the modern conveniences, she starts preparing a massive meal for this massive extended family, plus all of the guests from the synagogue, and she just gets after it. I mean, this is immediate and complete. In verse 32, it says, When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all those who were ill who were demon-possessed. And so sickness, demon possession, all of it starts stacking up at Jesus' door, or we should say Simon Peter's door because Jesus was at his house. And so it's, it's a kind of an interesting thought to think about why does Mark document that, when, that this is when evening came? And I don't want to connect too many dots to what's coming next in Mark, especially the next two chapters, but it's, it becomes very clear that the antagonism against Jesus Christ from the religious leaders is primarily revolves around the fact that he's violating their man-made traditions about the Sabbath. You can't heal on the Sabbath because that is work. In fact, in the Mishnah, on Tractate Yomo, chapter 8, verse 6, Rabbi Mattiah ben Hadrash says, he who has a pain in his throat, they drop medicine into his mouth on the Sabbath because it is a matter of doubt as to danger to life. And any matter of doubt as to danger of life overrides the prohibitions on the Sabbath. So you have a Jewish tradition where the Jewish leadership has created a man-made way to obey the Sabbath, which means nobody can be helped in any positive fashion on the Sabbath unless it's life-threatening. Life-threatening circumstances are the only exclusion to that kind of ridiculous prohibition on the Sabbath. But the people are still operating according to that kind of superstition and man-made tradition. So Mark records in verse 32 that when evening comes, after the sun goes down, now Sabbath is over, so now people can finally start getting help in this horrific man-made religion. They know Jesus is the real deal. I don't think they waited until after sundown because that's how long it took the word to get out. I mean, if you are chronically ill or if your loved one is possessed by a demon, you're not waiting (laughs) any time other than maybe for some superstition and some adherence to man-made tradition. So the sun goes down, Sabbath is over, prohibitions against healing are now over, and so suddenly Simon Peter's front door turns into a hospital ward. Verse 33 says, the whole city gathered at the door. Everybody shows up, and who wouldn't? Like I said, when you're chronically ill, as many of you are or have been, 
you would do anything for relief. And they show up, and I don't even think verse 33 is some sort of exaggeration to say the whole city, as if, as if it was just to say a lot of sick people. Because when you realize what's happening here, not just the sick people and not just the demon-possessed, but everybody else wants to see this as well. I mean, this is a phenomenon unlike anything they've ever seen or witnessed or even heard of. Verse 34, And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And again, the, the many here is not in contrast to um, all the people who showed up in verse 32 and 33 as if he just kind of selected a majority and just started performing a few miracles. The, point, the emphasis on the many is just the multifaceted nature and scope of what's happening. There's just there's a, a lot of sick people there. There's a lot of demon-possessed there. And he just starts healing. And so it's not a statement on limitation. It's a statement on scope. He actually healed everyone. I mean, what's happening here? It, we're, we're two stories into the body of Mark, and sickness and demon possession are being singularly eradicated out of Capernaum. And this shouldn't surprise us. I mean, this is the whole mission of the seed. You remember chapter, uh, well, we, we did this in the preface to the, the, the gospel of Mark. We talked about the seed promise in Genesis, and we talked about its expansion in Exodus, and all throughout the re redemptive histor uh, historical narrative of, of uh, 2 Samuel, even all the way down to David. And then we looked at the prophecies, especially Mark highlights Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3, and just shows how this seed, this messenger of the covenant, he's going to come. And, and I want to go back now and do a little bit more work that we didn't have time to do on the preface. And I think this is the right place to do it, to help you understand and appreciate in a fresh way what's happening here with these healings and with um, the reverse of the curse. Let me just listen to a couple of these texts. And these are a couple of prophecies from the book of Isaiah. Just Think of specifically about healing. There's a prophecy about um, the future uh, fulfillment of the kingdom and the arrival of the king and the seed, the son of David. And Isaiah 35 says this, Say to those with anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. This is a prophecy of the arrival of God on earth, and it's going to be vengeance and recompense for God's enemies and salvation for his people. Verse 5, then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, then the lame will leak, leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy, for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. And the Arabah is the wilderness uh, down by the Negev in, in southeastern um, Israel. And so you have every effect, virtually every effect in, in, a, in one prophecy being reversed. Sickness, disease, deformity, developmental delay, even the curse on an earth that was productive before God gave it to his people and their unbelief made it barren. You have the reverse of everything. I listened to this uh, prediction, talking about earth's productivity, healing, crime, and social justice. Isaiah 29, verse 17 says, Is it not yet just a little while before Lebanon will be turned into a fertile field, and the fertile field will be considered as a forest? On that day the deaf will hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. The afflicted also will increase their gladness in the Lord, and the needy of mankind will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel." For the ruthless will come to an end, and the scorner will be finished. Indeed, all who are intent on doing evil will be cut off, who cause a person to be indicted by a word, and ensnare him who adjudicates at the gate, and defraud the right of the one, I'm sorry, defraud the one in the right with meaningless arguments. I mean, you're talking about the reverse of the curse at, at the level of nature, the reverse of the curse at the level of disease, the reverse of the curse at the level of crime and social injustice. I mean, this is everything that we know in a cursed creation being turned upside down on its head by this individual when God comes in human form. We should not be surprised. When Jesus shows up, and here's the Son of God, people are healed, lame, have uh, limbs that are restored, 
mute, have tongues that are fixed, diseases eradicated, demon possession stops. And so, of course, it's just not surprising that the whole city shows up. Who wouldn't show up? If you're sick, you're showing up. If you're possessed by a demon, you're showing up. If you're not either of those, you're showing up. I want to see that. Verse 35. The story continues on. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. I mean, <laughs> virtually overnight, um, you, you have uh, Jesus' popularity meter just jumped. It just, it just blew, the, it blew the meter up, really. I mean, you're, it's just, just off the chart level of popularity. And so Jesus, to get a, moments, a moment by himself with his father, he has to leave early in the morning. So he slips out under cover of darkness when people can't even see him walking by. And it's that much of a priority for him to go pour out his heart to, the, to his father, to rely on the father. And, and just this, this bears mentioning, and this isn't, this isn't like emphasized in this, in this text, but the simple fact of Jesus' prayer life reminds us once again, Jesus is not just floating through this appearance of human existence, riding on the coattails of his deity, never actually encountering the challenges that we face trying to rely on the Lord from a position of limitation. Jesus, the Son of God, actually did take on humanity and live a very real human life in dependence on the Spirit, relying on his Father. And so he knows how important it is to pray. And what a rebuke to us <laughs> if Jesus knew the importance and how much he needed prayer. He needed prayer because of human limitation. We need prayer because of human limitation and our sinfulness. And so he slips away. He's keeping his face on his father. He's looking to his father for direction. He keeps his priority. All his priorities come from his father. He, he says whatever his father tells him to say. He does whatever his father tells him to do. And here he's looking to his father once again. Verse 36, though, here's the point that Mark is emphasizing. Simon and his companions searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. So you imagine what happens here. I mean, Jesus slips out under cover of darkness. The disciples wake up, and they probably woke up to people beating on their door once again. You know, it's probably like now the word's spread to, you know, you're getting out maybe down to farther around to the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee, maybe even heading over west toward Nazareth, maybe even starting to cross the sea overnight, if you know, depending on, on who was bringing the word where. But, I mean, the word is spreading. And they probably woke up to people knocking on their door. And the disciples are instantly at the ready. More popular demand, more curiosity, we got to make sure and connect this need to Jesus. And, and I don't doubt for a second that he was even well-intentioned. I, I believe that um, Peter and his companions, the four disciples, I believe they're thinking Jesus needs to know that he's still in high demand. And in fact, we don't want to let this you know, go unmet because there's a lot of opportunity for influence. And so they come and they're just like, hey, big massive line. We got to take a number installed on our front door. And I mean, we're running out of the paper. It's just we're flying through it. And Jesus just says, let's go somewhere else. Now that could sound like Jesus doesn't care, but that would be an impossible conclusion after what we just read. He has selflessly, he, he let no sickness or demon possession go unmet. He is the pinnacle of compassion for human suffering, for human suffering of any kind, physical or spiritual. He is the pinnacle of compassion. When he says, let's go somewhere else, it's not a lack of compassion. It is a focus on his God-given priority. Before we look at verse 38 and 39, I just want to pause for a second, and I want to, I want to highlight what, what's happening here. As Mark tells this story, we see a lot of responses. 
We see a lot of responses to, to Jesus. First of all, you see the demons. We saw it last week. If you go all the way back to um, verse 24, the demon cries out, what business do we have with each other? In other words, why are you interfering with me, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I mean, this demon recognizes intrinsically Jesus' authority. The demon knows he is under the authority of Jesus Christ. And so he's sitting there saying, have you come to destroy me? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. So he silences him because he doesn't want, Jesus doesn't want the demon's bad publicity. Now, skip down to, to our, our narrative. So now, in verse 34, notice how verse 34 ends. After he, he had healed everyone and cast out all of these demons, 34b says, he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Now you think, okay, well, Mark's documenting this is the most shocking identity. Here comes Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth and his identity is he's the Son of God, and it doesn't seem like anyone's getting that except the demons. And the demons are starting to share that, and they're ready to broadcast that, and Jesus is silencing them. I mean, this is free advertising for the movement, Jesus. Just take advantage of it. Let them blab. Let everyone know you're the Son of God. What is going on here? He is prohibiting their bad publicity because it's not promoting his purposes. Let me show you that for a second. Skip down to where we'll be in the next narrative, when we get there, verse 45 says this leper who was healed goes out and begins to blab and proclaim it freely to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. I mean, this was a healing of a man who was notably enslaved to his unbelief. Jesus had so much compassion, he heals him anyway. And he warns him with anger, do not blab about this. And he totally disregards Jesus and blabs about it. The publicity hinders Jesus from his teaching and preaching ministry. The same thing happens in the very next narrative. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. What else would Jesus be doing except speaking the word to him? And then, of course, we remember the story because the story is so dramatic. A paralytic being brought in, it's so crowded, they can't even get to the door. They drop him through the roof tiles, and then he gets healed, and that's a demonstration of his power and authority to forgive sins. But, wow, wow. Uh, it actually stopped him from preaching the word. Not that Jesus is complaining, not that he's begrudging to minister and alleviate someone's sufferings, but that is not his priority. Of course, healing, reversing the, cur the curse, casting out demons, I mean, that's in his bloodstream, that's in his DNA, because he's the seed, he's the son of Eve, he's the son of David. That's just who he is. But his priority is preaching. And these demons are going to give him publicity about his identity that is not going to help. It's going to increase the hostility. It's going to make his, him more in focus and the object of the hostility from the Jewish leaders. It's going to uh, jam up his schedule and fill an otherwise pretty hefty day planner with a lot more distractions and a lot more demands. In fact, as we're going to see in Mark chapter 6, verse 31, that the demands on his public ministry were so great that they had to find a way to isolate just in order to get time for a meal so that Jesus could instruct his disciples. So this kind of publicity is not helping his primary cause of preaching the word. So what motivates the demons? Bad press. They want to give him that kind of publicity. They want to highlight, here's a healer. Because they want to stop the preaching of the word. Look at the people's response. Chapter, in verse 32, in our, in our chapter 1, verse 32 in verse, to verse 34, everybody wants to come. Everybody's coming to see it. Verse 37, again, the next morning, everyone's looking for you. I mean, the response of the people is, curiosity and self-love. Bored people want to be entertained. Sick people want to be healed. I mean, sickness has a way of consuming us, doesn't it? 
I don't suffer well. I want relief immediately. Um, and perhaps what's even worse is uh, for you who maybe suffer from something a more, in a more chronic fashion, it's the emotional toll and the, and the burden and strain of even anticipating what your future might be and what, how long will this last and the, the longing for um, resolution, for relief, for cure can become, can become absolutely consuming. Not to mention sickness wanting cured or bored people wanting to be entertained by a miracle. Hungry people want to be fed and Jesus understood that. He even said in, in John chapter 6, you know, you, you just came because you got a free meal. They weren't coming to get the word of life. They were coming to get a, a, free, a free lunch. And people have always been attracted to the benefits of Christ and not his message. People have always been eager to see the benefits of Christianity in their society, the benefits of Christ's likeness in their own relationships to the degree that they would benefit from those relationships being Christ-like. And that does not mean for a second that those people want Christ's message. What about the disciples? The disciples in verse 36 and verse 37 they, they're, they're, they're motivated by Christ's popularity. And um, like I said, I don't, I'm not trying to impose something on them as though it was uh, malicious or as if they were, you know, genuinely like, oh, let's just, let's just you know, let's just make sure that Jesus doesn't have a, have a moment to preach. I don't believe they thought that for a second. But what they are doing is they have taken it upon themselves to be the managers and promoters of Jesus's popularity. The disciples are now in a role where they are managing and promoting Jesus' popularity to increase his influence. And they're, they're trying to make sure that, man, this is a good thing we've got going here. Let's continue this. We don't want this to abate. Listen, the demons want to hinder Jesus' preaching and teaching by the bad publicity that they would give to a nation full of self-loving curiosity seekers. Meanwhile, the disciples are uninformed of Jesus' priority on teaching. They're, they're very aware of the popularity that he's receiving and, and generating with these healings and these exorcisms. The end result of the intentions of the demons and the disciples are the same. Both distract from the preaching of the word. This is... This is what Mark is documenting, preparing us for the unbelief of the nation and the unbelief of the Jewish leaders and even still resident unbelief to some degree in the, in the disciples' hearts. And so that's why Jesus has to correct the disciples in verse 38 and say, let's go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach because that's what I came for. Jesus came to preach. Preaching the word of God. That is paramount. You know, when you think about the motives and the responses to people, um, not only the demons, but then also the people of the nation, the people who lived in Capernaum, and then, of course, the disciples, and you look at those three responses, you can really start to see those three responses starting to manifest themselves in even how we think about what it means to follow Jesus Christ in the American church, can't you? You know what it's like. I mean, I don't, have to, I don't have to contextualize this for you. You live in America. I mean, we live in a world where uh, the, the, the church in this country could, has so many different forms and so many different MOs and so many different approaches. Um, you, you've got an approach um, to every single kind of need and malady and self-loving curiosity seekers can find a custom-tailored ministry that's going to scratch their itch. You know, this is what happens with the modern-day healing ministries modern-day healing ministries. You know, they, 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 they prey on people who are genuinely ill and sick and take their money. And I remember, I remember one time, I was, I was back in the days, I was preaching through the book of Acts, and, and I was, as I was preaching through the book of Acts, um, it just impressed me that I, I, I received in the mail one week while I was studying through what the, was happening in the early church, and the apostles are preaching a new message. It's been newly revealed. And of course, as is always the case with new revelation uh, from cover to cover, you read, study the book of uh, scriptures, new revelation will be attested with signs, wonders, and miracles. And that's happening in the book of Acts because the apostles are now preaching New Testament revelation, new truths, 
And so as they give a new message, it's being affirmed by miracles. And while I'm studying that, while I'm teaching on that, I receive in the mail a miracle handkerchief. I was so excited to get my miracle handkerchief because I love miracles and I'd love to get a miracle. And for this miracle handkerchief, was just all it, all it involved was just me mailing it back with a little bit of money in it to the guy who sent it to me, and he was going to pray all over that ha- miracle handkerchief. And so, um, so I sent it back without a check. And no, just kidding, I didn't do that. But <laughs> I, you know, you just think about like all the gimmicks and all the how how you know if, if when you're afflicted and when you're suffering, you you long for relief. And then people who aren't uh, equipped and and that they haven't heard the word of God and they don't understand the truth of who Jesus is in His word because they haven't heard the preaching and teaching of the word, they get taken advantage of. I mean, you remember what happened, you know. Um, Bethel Church in Reading, when they were, there was a tragic um, loss of a child in one of the families at Bethel Church in Reading, and so they had a resurrection service back in uh, December of 2019. A day later, they said, okay, God raises the dead, so we're going to pray to raise the dead, and then a day goes by and it doesn't happen. Okay, well, no, we're gonna, another day is going to go by. Oh, it's going to be the third day, because that's when Jesus rose. Fourth day, because that's before you know, Lazarus was raised, before he... And they just keep coming up with new verses and new verses until you run out of verses, and they have to recognize, okay, God didn't raise her from the dead. And you think, what's the attraction to that ministry? What, of course what the attraction is, is if, if, if I'm sick and if I'm suffering, I, I want relief. It is attractive to my self-love. This, this has been common in our country for at least 100 years, going back to 1906. Smed just mentioned it in Equipping Hour, you go back 30 years ago, and you've got the, the booming church growth movement really fueled by the, theolo- the theology of Robert Schuller and most of those church growth movement strategies that came out. It's like clockwork. Like every five to seven years, there's a new variation of it built on the same theology of Robert Schuller, which is his, his classic book was um, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation. And uh, he's saving people from having low thoughts of themselves, and so salvation is having high thoughts of yourselves. And as Sved pointed out, no, we need to be saved from our high thoughts of ourselves. That's what we need to be saved from. That kind of theology is attractive, and it pleases me in my own sin. You fast forward another 10 years, and then what became common in America is an approach to ministry that really is uh, seeking to make the world a better place. The philanthropy of the transformational movement Uh, Usually you'll hear buzzwords like increasing human flourishing, uh, the cultural mandate, uh, making the world a better place, um, establishing the reign of Christ on earth, and so on and so forth. Well, I'm I'm certainly a big proponent of Christ's reign on earth, and that's why I'm preaching. Get ready, because he's coming back and he's going to set up a reign of righteousness. But he's never called me to create a surrogate version. It's going to be a pretty pathetic one at that. But what happens is, The transformational movement is actually doing the same thing, appealing to a culture on the basis of its self-love and curiosity-seeking. It's actually doing the same thing. One proponent of the, probably the the most popular articulation of the transformational movement would be Tim Keller, and in his book, Center Church, he said that you need to evaluate a ministry not according to its success, not according to its faithfulness, but according to its fruitfulness. He goes on to explain, look, there's a lot of faithful people out there that are faithful to the Word of God, but they're not having fruit, the kind of fruit that we want to see. And so then he goes on to say that their church has earned the label of fruitful because, quote, we had thousands of the very kind of secular, sophisticated young adults that the church was not reaching. You say, well, how did you do it? What made you so fruitful? Which, by the way, his definition of fruitful is actually indistinguishable from his definition of success. And so he says it's not success, it's fruitfulness, and he turns around to describe success. So what does he do? He says, look, what what you need to do, if you're going to really, and and, and I, I kind of view this in this mode of Mark 1, 29 to 39, in these responses to Jesus Christ, there's, there's a real desire to increase Jesus' popularity, isn't there? And you think about even saying it that way. Could I, a sinner, speck of dust, saved by grace, increase Christ's popularity? Really? I think Christ is going to do quite well on his own. He wasn't interested in increasing his popularity in this fashion. 
Here's, here's how you do it. This articulation of it says, look, Christians need to critique and affirm elements in every culture. He creates the, the dichotomy between A-truths and B-truths. A-truths are truths that you can affirm because they're good in the culture, and B-truths are the ones that you have to confront because they're bad. And so he, create, he creates the analogy of, a, of, a, of stones versus logs. If you try to float stones down the river, they won't go anywhere. They just sink, and you'll never get anywhere with those stones. But you put a log in the river, it's going to float. So you have to float the stones, which are the offensive doctrines, on the logs. And so here's his example. He compares Manhattan to Islam. A doctrine like turn the other cheek, according to those in the Manhattan culture, that's an A doctrine, because they're so friendly and hospitable, and they turn the other cheek, and they care about people. But in the Muslim culture, that's um, insulting, degrading, and, de and beneath your dignity. So that's a B doctrine in the Muslim culture. Whereas you take a doctrine like sexual purity and the, the command for abstinence until marriage and uh, protecting um, um, sexual purity, that's a B doctrine in Manhattan, but an A doctrine in Islam. And so what you have to do is you have to be able to affirm those doctrines before you can confront anything. So he creates this dynamic where he's creating a way to flatter the person who would potentially be coming to Christ. By the way, as if, as if any unbeliever in Manhattan is truly loving their neighbor and as if any um, unbeliever in an Islamic country is um, um, truly glorifying God with their sexuality. We can do nothing apart from Christ. And so he goes on to articulate that we need to um, be a part of healing God's new creation and healing the world, and we do that through um, influencing society in um, all sorts of areas, including arts, including um, print, printing houses and media, and including politics and law. When you fast forward from the transformational movement, you find the same thing even in the, the current woke movement and the critical race theory. And, and, and Omri, I don't have to repeat anything Omri just said, because Omri just gave a phenomenal treatment of that uh, in the quipping hours uh, a couple months ago. Omri, Omri uh, passed this on to me, this quote from Eric Mason. He says this, he says, we're called to follow his example of caring for the physical needs of others in order that the gospel witness of the kingdom might saturate the earth. And you can see what's happening in the woke movement is we found, the church has found a popular doctrine that the culture is continuing to repeat, and if we can get on the bandwagon, then that will earn us the right to share the gospel. The idea is, if we can find out what the world's naturally attracted to, then we can use that for the influence of the gospel. The question then becomes, has, could the church ever relieve enough physical infirmities? Could it ever raise the gross domestic product of this country high enough? Could it ever increase the quality of living in our communities and remove enough graffiti and change enough legislation that we would find ourselves so attractive to a lost and dying world that at that point they would finally start listening to the word of Jesus Christ? No, never. Why? Because the sales pitch we just gave them pandered to self-love. And then the Christian's going to turn right around after creating that following and say, repent of your self-love. What? That's the whole reason you got me here. Jesus was used to this kind of popularity. John 6, 25 and 26 they found him on the other side of the sea, and they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you do not seek me because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Listen, Grace Bible Church, if anyone, if anyone could earn a hearing and earn the right to share an offensive gospel to someone who is hostile to it by means of philanthropy, healing and social justice, it was Jesus Christ, and he didn't do that. Jesus' ministry was preaching. Let's look back at Mark chapter 1, verse 38. He says to them, let's go somewhere else 
the towns nearby so that I can preach there also, because that is what I came for. That's the goal. That's his mission. Preaching is the function of the herald. The herald in Greco-Roman times had the dignity of the, of the authority that he came to represent. Every prince, every governing official had a herald, and in many cases they had several. Uh, he had political and religious significance. Nobles were called, I mean, heralds were called nobles in society because they had the high calling of representing somebody uh, with an authority. His status depends on the one who commissioned him. His qualities, and this is again a secular herald, this is just somebody representing a secular king or even the emperor, Caesar himself. His physical qualities, he had to have a powerful voice. If he doesn't have a powerful voice, he's useless. He has to be able to summon men to the assembly. He has to summon and, and, and raise warriors to battle. He's, he's responsible for peace and order in the assembly where he's announcing the message of the authority that he's, he's come to preach and to herald and to proclaim. And so character was obviously required because apart from the predominant questions of his voice, he had to have enough character to be able to represent the message well and to not twist it. Uh, there's always a danger of giving false news. And so if an authority couldn't trust his herald, then he has no authority and his message is going to get botched. So since behind the herald stands a higher power, the herald doesn't express his own views. He only expresses the views of the person who sent him. And so here comes Jesus as a herald of God. His mission is to preach. In the remaining few minutes, let me show you a couple of examples of this from the Old Testament. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18 is a, an incredible prophecy about what's going to happen, how God's going to provide a prophet like Moses. Deuteronomy 18, let's jump in at verse 15. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Moses writes, Then the Lord, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. Same exhortation that God gave Israel back in Exodus 23 about the angel of the covenant. My, my name is in him. Listen to him and hear my voice. An equal sign between the angel of the Lord and God himself in Exodus 23 and now here there's an equal sign between God's voice and this coming human prophet. Verse 16, this is according to all you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore or I die. The Lord said to me, they've spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of, of him. What an incredible prophecy, because now you realize that Jesus Christ comes as the Son of God in human form to be the human mouthpiece for God's message. It was too much for a sinful nation to hear God speaking from the top of Sinai unmediated. Moses, you go up there. Tell us what he said. It's too much. And so God says, okay, I'm going to send my son, a prophet like Moses. Skip over to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59. And what's so sweet about this is just seeing the fulfillment in Mark 138. No wonder, Jesus said, his mission was to come preach, because this is what was prophesied about him. Uh, Isaiah 59, verse 20, no, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them. Who's the them? The them is Jacob and those in Zion, verse 20. The them is plural. It's a plural pronoun. As for me, God speaking about himself, this is my covenant, singular, with them, plural, referring to those in verse 20. 
says the Lord Yahweh. My spirit which is upon you. And he turns right around and speaks in a singular pronoun to the individual whom he's speaking to. My spirit is upon you. And my words which I have put in your mouth, singular, shall not depart from your mouth, nor the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. This is a prophecy of the Messiah who's going to come with God's words in his mouth, and that word of righteousness won't depart from his mouth or those who are his corporate seed, those who belong to the Son. Now we know is Jesus Christ. Skip over to chapter 61. Skip a chapter. Chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. You have the Spirit of God. You have Yahweh God. Uh, Adonai Yahweh, and a divine speaker, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to do what? To bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I mean, that's a prophecy of Jesus Christ, and he's come to preach, to preach the good news. We could look at other examples, notably Ezekiel 34. Read Ezekiel 34 with this in mind, and you realize God's raising up a shepherd, a shepherd David, who will shepherd his people and give them his word, give them his truth. Listen, wherever the truth is being taught, even when it was originally revealed and affirmed with signs, wonders, and miracles, the message always overshadowed the miracles. Read Acts 19. Paul is preaching, and the sons of Sceva try to do what he does. They don't have any authority, and they get beat up by the demons. And the people who see the difference, they don't walk away and say, you know what, tomorrow night we're going back to Paul because he's got a better show. He puts on better miracles, better signs and wonders. You know what they say? They say, Paul's message is legit, and we need to repent. I mean, the modern fetish with making Jesus popular, whether that comes by healing or exorcism or miraculous gifts or paranormal phenomenon or transforming the culture or increasing human flourishing or redeeming the culture or legislating Christian morals. It's all the same. None of it, none of it's accomplishing what they tell us will accomplish. It never wins over an offensive gospel to those who love themselves. Let's put this narrative together with last week's story about the Sabbath synagogue. And there's, there's two elements in Jesus' preaching and teaching that need to be in the forefront of our minds. Last week, we saw that uh, Jesus emphasized that his teaching possesses authority. And this week, we see that it's his priority. We put these two together, and we start to really, really uh, immediately realize why the demons did what they did why the people responded the way they responded, and why the disciples responded the way they responded, and why Christ responded to the response the way he responded. We cannot lose sight of preaching because he knows this is their need. Regardless of what a blind, spiritually depraved person would claim is his need, and no matter how he defines love, Jesus knows that what's most loving is to preach the truth. And that's more important than even alleviating physical suffering. And so for us, as we benefit from this narrative, we think about the implications of what Jesus is showing us here about the priority of his ministry, we got to realize, look, if we're going to follow Jesus in the way, if we're going to follow him as his disciples, In light of what we learned last week, it's not enough to just know what Jesus did. It's not enough to know what he taught. The question is, do we submit to his authority? And in light of what we see here, the priority is preaching. If we're going to benefit from last week's, we've got to submit. If we're going to benefit from this week's, we've got to rightly divide the word. We've got to make the articulation of the word everything. And that's getting lost. Name me one ministry that's known for transforming the culture and redeeming the society and known for healing ministries that's actually more known for its precision and articulation of biblical truth than it even is its miracles or its transformation. Name one. 
And they don't exist. Grace Bible Church, what the world hasn't seen, what so much of the world hasn't seen, is a group of Christians submitting to God's word. And even at great personal cost, suffering, and effort, laboring to rightly divide it and make it known. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's his ministry. In your name, we want to pray these things, Lord, because we, we really need your help in this. As your church, we, we come before you just asking that you would help us to follow in your example. And Lord, obviously, you have never given us authority to cast out demons or to heal. Um, you called us to preach you called us to preach the word until you return, to proclaim your coming until that day. And when you arrive, Lord, you're going, to have, you're going to need no aid from us to establish a reign of righteousness, to right every wrong, to end the need for a judicial department or police office uh, or any, any kind of a medical uh, facility. You're going to eradicate all of that with the sheer uh, righteous reign that you will um, um, exact on this earth. And so, Lord, we look forward to that day. And as long as you wait, we just want to be faithful to submit to your word and to rightly divide your word, to promote your word. And I pray, Lord, that we would have great impact. I pray that this is even a helpful, um, a helpful exhortation to us in a, in a world where so many approaches to ministry are, are maximizing popularity and, and they're, they're, they're doing, doing things that would actually distract from and hinder the preaching of your word. And so, Lord, I just pray that that would be a protection for us because, Lord, we want to be faithful to the Great Commission. We want to preach your gospel until you return because that's what you've called us to do. And those two missions are completely at odds, Lord. I, uh, there's just no way. There's, there's, dear, there's dear believers getting caught up in approaches to ministry that are, are at odds with preaching your word. And, and, of course, the answer is they always say, they can do both. But Lord, guard our hearts against that. We know that if we follow in your footsteps, we'll be hated like, like you were. And yet we see believers getting caught up in it and becoming popular in a way you never did. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would protect us. Lord, your word is of inestimable value. It's why you came to give human voice to the words of your Father, Lord Jesus. Without it, we would perish. Without it, we have no hope. Without it, we have no light. Without it, we have no ability to help, to build up. We have no deliverance from our own sin. We have no deliverance from our own self-love, our own curiosity seeking. Only by the means of your word can we be saved from these things the very things that so much of your self-professed church is actually using to increase its own following. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would sustain us just to be faithful. I pray that we'd be content to be, uh, re receive the same response, Father, that your son received. Hostility. Just, just, just please let us love your truth and your word more than ourselves so that we could be faithful. In your name I pray. Amen.